Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Nancy Lindborg. I'm the president of the US Institute of Peace. And I'm delighted you're able to join us here this afternoon. Thank you for braving the, the rain and the wind. Um, US Institute of Peace was founded in 1984 by Congress, uh, dedicated to the very bold proposition that peace is very possible, that it's very practical, and that it is absolutely essential for US and international security. And nowhere is this vision more urgent than in Syria. Um, the conflict is now entering its eighth year. We just had a weekend of events that further complicate a very complicated, uh, long conflict with the news of the US strikes on chemical weapons. I think for anyone who's been following this conflict, the physical, the human devastation of this conflict are truly overwhelming. And the recent chemical weapons attack in Douma, um, which killed dozens of civilians, including women and children, is the latest example of the very terrible carnage that we've been watching through the years. Um, nearly half a million uh, estimated Syrians have died in the violence. Half the population of the country has been displaced, either internally or as refugees. And we have one of the largest and most complex humanitarian catastrophes since World War II. We've seen that this conflict has transgressed so many different legal and moral norms. Uh, we've seen civilians attacked. We've seen medical uh, workers specifically targeted, uh, and the kind of uh, atrocities that women and children and, and civilians have seen that will scar people for a lifetime. And according to UNICEF, if the current pace of violence continues, this year will be the most violent uh, since 2011. And in just the first two months of 2018, an estimated 1,000 children, so it's only April, 1,000 children have been killed or injured as a part of this war. Um, we've seen increasing research that demonstrates the terrible effects of prolonged exposure to stress and to conflict on your brain, that these are the unseen wounds that threaten not just Syrians today, but Syrians tomorrow. And they will threaten uh, any efforts at recovery if we don't start thinking about these efforts now. Um, there is important work do, being done on this, and it is even more important that we pay attention uh, to these unseen wounds, that we understand the impacts of violence, not just on people physically, but the emotional long-term results of living in conflict and prolonged stress. Um, I spent three years at USAID directing humanitarian response to Syria in the early years of the conflict. And I can say it was a daily heartbreak to see what started as a peaceful demonstration in seek of a better, more responsive government, the metastasizing into the war that we've seen today. I will also note that I had an extraordinary opportunity, and I think all of us have continued to see some of those who have responded with unbelievable courage and compassion and who continue to work on these issues and to go into terrible war zones uh, when they don't have to over and over again. Um, today's panel includes some of those people and some of those organizations. And it also will, it promises to deepen our collective understanding of both the impact of the trauma and some of the ways that we can think about addressing those challenges. And we're very fortunate to have with us representatives from the State Department, uh, from Save the Children, um, and from the Syrian American Medical Society. And I first encountered the Syrian American Medical Society, or SAMS, in the early days of the war when they were really calling attention to the targeting of medical personnel. And I just want to recognize David Lilly, who's here with us today, the executive director of the Syrian American Medical Society. And we thank you and all your colleagues for the extraordinary courage that they've demonstrated through this conflict. Um, for those of you who would like to follow or to join the conversation on Twitter, please use hashtag Syria trauma. That's hashtag Syria trauma. 
And I'd also uh, encourage you to check out the USIP new podcast network at usip.org slash podcasts. And that will include this event and many other compelling programs um, into the future. So with that, um, I'm delighted to be able to introduce my colleague, uh, Mona Yakubian, who's our senior advisor for Syria uh, in the Middle East and North Africa here at USIP. Mona herself has long, deep background in these issues, and she will moderate the panel for you here today. Thank you again for joining us, and thank you for paying attention to this really critical issue. Mona. Thank you so much, Nancy. Um, and let me also add my word of welcome and good afternoon to all of you. Um, this is indeed, as Nancy has laid out, I think very clearly, such an important topic. We had originally hoped to do this a couple months ago, and we got snowed out. And I have to say, I think it's, um, it's a testament to our, our colleagues on the panel, including Dr. Hamza, who traveled here now not once but twice to take part in this panel as to the importance of the topic at hand. Um, I think, as we all know, we all see the very disturbing images coming from Syria. They're achingly painful to look at, in particular, of course, uh, most recently with the chemical weapons attack on Douma earlier this month. What we don't see are those hidden wounds, uh, the trauma that so many Syrian civilians, including children, are suffering. And that's what we do. It's a painful topic, but yet a very important one. That's what we hope to delve into today with this excellent panel. We'll be looking at the issue of trauma in the Syrian conflict, try to understand better its dimensions, but also try to learn a bit more about some of the interventions that are being designed to help begin to address this issue and also get a better grasp of some of the longer term implications at hand. So with that, I'd like to introduce our panel and I will engage with them for a little bit in discussion, and then we will bring all of you in, into it. This discussion, this event is on the record, uh, and again, you're encouraged to tweet and, and join the discussion. First, let me introduce our very esteemed panel. We have to my immediate right, Dr. Muhammad Khalid Hamza, who is currently chairman of the Syrian American Medical Society's Mental Health Committee. He also serves on its foundation board. Dr. Hamza is also a tenured professor of clinical mental health at Lamar University in Texas. In addition to his long-standing publications and presentations, he has conducted extensive research on the impact of trauma in the, in the Syrian conflict and has a forthcoming report that will be available to all of you once it is completed. Next to Dr. Hamza, I'm pleased to welcome Amy Richmond, who is the Child Protection in Emergencies Director at Save the Children. In her current role, she oversees the Child Protection and Emergencies portfolio and team, providing strategic direction, technical oversight, and humanitarian response support. Uh, Amy is a specialist in child protection systems in conflict, and she has responded to the Syrian refugee crisis in Jordan, Lebanon, Iraq, and Turkey. And finally, last but certainly not least, it's a pleasure to welcome Katie Boumaroun, who is a foreign affairs officer currently with the State Department's Near Eastern Affairs Bureau Office of Assistance Coordination. Katie's portfolio is focused on governance and education, uh, programming uh, in non-regime held areas in Syria. She returned recently from six weeks inside northeastern Syria, including Raqqa City where she had the opportunity to visit a number of uh, State Department supported child centers that provide remedial literacy and psychosocial support to vulnerable populations. So with that, let me open the conversation and maybe start with you, Dr. Hamza. Um, people may not be completely familiar with your organization, SAMS, the Syrian American Medical Society, and what you do. So maybe talk a little bit just to get us started on SAMS work and how it started and, and where things are today. Uh, we started in 1998 as a cultural, you know, professional organization. Uh, fun, you know, before nine, <laughs> 2011. And then when the, um, you know, revolution started in 2011, and as you've seen and as uh, indicated earlier, you know, peaceful demonstration happened and took place for almost a year and a half um, it was Sam start collecting its uh, 
its powers and uh, started uh, working um, diligently on what about to happen. We expected the worst because uh, they are to ask for freedom, you know, in, in, in those um, uh, places like Syria. But anyway, so now um, we are taking care of almost uh, over 100 facilities, medical facilities. We are humanitarian, medical humanitarian aid, and we operate uh, inside Syria and refugee camps um, in Jordan, in Lebanon, and uh, in Turkey. We have a huge operation, and um, the CEO of SAMS, I'm happy to uh, tell you that Mr. Uh, David Lilly is here with us um, to join, uh, he joined us, and uh, so that's simply what SAMS does, and uh, we build hospitals, uh, clinics, uh, as if probably you've seen CBS 60 Minute uh, mm -hmm. News on, uh, you know, a little bit on the cave hospitals because many of our hospitals were destroyed, um, you know, by airstrikes. Uh, and that's, you know, where we're at right now. We're trying to save lives, one life at a time, you know, of um, the Syrians and uh, working very hard at it. Mm -hmm. So you, in your, some of your research, you coined the term human devastation. Right. as a way of describing and talking about this, the issue of trauma right. amongst Syrian civilians. Can you tell us a little bit more about you know, how do you describe the, the issue? What, what are some of the key features of trauma amongst the Syrian population living in conflict? As you know, the conflict has been going on for eight years, and um, sometimes um, I just don't feel right using the word conflict because it's beyond the conflict. It's ethnic cleansing. It is a genocide that's been going on for eight years. Um, when we started diagnosing the individuals, the patients, the beneficiaries, um, different places, most of the diagnoses came in as in PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And of course, um, comorbidities joining other you know uh, disorders such as uh, significant depression like major depression um, we reach the, the psychosis and um, um, behaviors abnormal behaviors um, the anxieties uh, panic attacks you name it but as we worked year after year it was very interesting to see that really it's PTSD is kind of like uh, creating a suit that fits all, and it's not the case. Because in any disorder that you look at, of course, just to, you know, uh, to give you a little information, we use something called the DSM-5. So consider that that's the reference for all psychiatric, you know, psychological disorders and so on. And usually when you read on any disorder as a professional trying to say, okay, is this person major depression or little depression, sadness, or are they bipolar, or whatever. They say, you know, one or more of the following criteria should be met. Uh, well, here, it's one, not, and more. It's everything plus more. So the frequency and the magnitude and the depth of the, um, um, of, of the disorders is two-folds, three-folds of what we have seen. So the psychological injuries are very deep and very profound. So it was to the point I was like, it's not going to fit to just saying PTSD, PTSD. There has to be a lot more. But there was nothing, again, let's call it the psychiatric manual, the DSM-5, that would really describe the, uh, the severity of what we are seeing. Um, also, when you read about any disorder, they tell you there is a time to cope. Well, what cope? What coping? Because it's a... Uh, one nightmare that keeps the exposure every day, and you're talking about years. And even for those that were able, they were displaced, and they moved to other refugee camps, and so on, it wasn't going from here and the grass is greener on, on, greener on the other side. They went through a different, disastrous situation in a completely different uh, environment and climate. So that added a lot more 
if you want to say it, to their misery, to their uh, agony, to their pain, to their suffering, but it was a completely different context, but the pain continued. Mm -hmm. So we kept moving from one episode of a tragedy or one episode of dilemma and you're talking about profound. We're not talking about, well, it will be okay tomorrow. Well, it's not okay tomorrow. It's not okay even eight years after into another. So because of that, the only um, uh, disorder that fits uh, their situation, uh, you know, mental health situation to describe it well is the human devastation syndrome, which currently we've been working on it. I have, um, an outstanding team of researchers, um, you name it, uh, psychiatrists, psychologists, statisticians, and we're working hard on uh, uh, investigating a little more what is a human devastation syndrome. Amy, I'd like to bring you in um, and maybe just begin by also for those who aren't fully familiar with Save the Children and its focus on children and protection, but specifically maybe tell us a bit more about what Save the Children has done with respect to the Syrian conflict. Sure. Currently, Save the Children's working with Syrian children and their families in the region in Jordan, um, Iraq, Lebanon, and Turkey, and refugee camps and host, um, host communities. And we're also working through and with local partners in Syria, providing um, child protection services, including community-based psychosocial support, access to learning spe spaces and education, health care services and support, and food security and livelihoods, including um, young child and infant feeding. Um, and can you, can you talk a little bit more about, um, I know that, that Save the Children, I think you even have copies of it out, outside, mm -hmm. but published a very powerful report entitled Invisible Wounds that looks very specifically at the issue of trauma in children. Can you talk a little bit more about the findings uh, in that report and kind of how you, from your organization's vantage point, how you see um, this, this, the issue of, of trauma, particularly in children, and what the implications are. Yeah, sure, thanks. So last year we undertook this research because we were facing, as said before, an unprecedented crisis. Over 12 million Syrians displaced, and that's 65% of the country, country's population. And Save the Children estimates that as we speak every hour, 250 more children are fleeing with their families. Um, and the psychological toll of this experiencing w and witnessing violence compounded by the ongoing deprivation that displacement causes creates a situation that we call toxic stress mm -hmm. that we've already been talking a little bit about here. And toxic stress, if left untreated, neurological evidence shows us can have devastating impact on children's healthy physical and mental development. And since Save the Children have, has been working with these children for over seven years now, um, we've been very worried about the implications of, of this in their development in the next generation. So we undertook a comprehensive study inside Syria, talking to children, healthcare, social welfare practitioners, um, to examine, examine their current mental and um, emotional well-being. And I brought some of our key findings here today to share with you. We found that two-thirds of the children that uh, our partner staff work with are said to have lost a loved one, had their house bombed or shelled, or suffered war-related injuries. 51% of the practitioners that we talked to said that children are tur turning to drugs to cope with stress, which we know can have devastating impact on their lives. 89% of those working with children said the children that they're working with's behavior has become more fearful and nervous as the war goes on. 71% said that children are increasingly suffering from common symptoms of toxic stress and PTSD, which as is critical, critical because as we just discussed, um, our research also shows that out of the functioning health facilities inside Syria, only 20% have mental health care staff that can appropriately diagnose PTSD um, and treat it. Treat it. Um, and in addition to that, I brought some quotes from children today to make sure that we do bring the voice of the child directly here today. Mm -hmm. um, they describe some of their feelings uh, in our report. And Abud, age 12, told us, I always feel angry all the time. 
rehab age eight from Aurora Aleppo told us, I'm afraid of going to school because a plane will bomb us. Allah, age 12, told us, I would be confused if I didn't hear or see, see airstrikes because they happen so often. So as we see and as we know, millions of children are missing the normal aspects of a child. And if we don't scale up or commit to providing basic emotional support for these children and access to education, safe places to return to normal child's childhood, mm -hmm. we risk losing a generation to these invisible wounds. Mm -hmm. And this will have, as Nancy Limbert had said, devastating impacts to rebuilding the country when the conflict ends. So I want us to at some point get into interventions, but I want to first uh, bring Katie into the conversation and maybe have you talk a bit about the U.S. government's civilian assistance programming in Syria. I know your portfolio focuses on, as you said, education and governance. But tell us, for those who aren't familiar, a little bit more about what the, what the United States government is doing in that space inside Syria. Sure. So my office, the Office of Assistance Coordination, is just a small piece in the larger USG um, a, a response to Syria. Um, so in particular, my portfolio covers governance and education. Um, so a bit on the governance stuff, we work with local provincial councils um, to build their legitimacy within their communities to provide essential services. So um, for example, in the east and northeastern Syria, we're working with a lot of the local governance bodies um, to bring water back online, to provide waste management services to their communities. Um, on the education side, and I think this is where we have kind of found the, the PSS or psychosocial support um, extremely important is that we're trying to provide a, a, an alternative education to children in Syria. Um, as many of you know, it's either the regime curriculum um, or in other areas what we have kind of t coined as the Syrian interim government, the SIG cur curriculum. Um, and then in the East, I think it's more of a, a, a battle of which curriculum um, will be implemented. Um, but I think with going back to your original question on what we're doing in the education realm in northeastern Syria specifically, um, is we're starting with PSS. Um, we understand that most of these children, all of these children have gone through things that none of us can ever imagine, none of us can ever fathom. Um, and so by putting children in a formal classroom setting, you're actually doing more damage um, than good. Um, it took a while for us to kind of convince local governance bodies um, that psychosocial support was something that was the first step. Um, but I think that we've been able to get that local buy-in um, to really see children who have gone in very aggressive. Um, as Amy had said, um, children are, 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 are suffering. Um, and you know we've had examples of children who have gone into some of our centers, which we'll talk about shortly, um, who have been angry, who have been aggressive. Mm -hmm. um, and so as the USG kind of setting up uh, some areas where children have a safe space um, and able to be children once again. So um, I think we would all be fascinated to hear what you witnessed firsthand, having spent six weeks in northeastern Syria, including in Raqqa City. Can you tell us a bit more about what you saw in the time that you were there? What were you doing? What did you see? How does what you saw sort of comport with what we're hearing more broadly in terms of the extent of trauma uh, amongst children and, and in the population, broadly speaking? So the population writ large um, has faced significant trauma. Um, doesn't matter, children age one to two to older elderly, um, they have seen more trauma in their life than any of us will imagine. But the one thing that I, I took away um, driving through Rucka City where there's, it's flat, um, where there used to be houses and buildings and shops, um, there's nothing. But the one thing I took away was that the Syrian people are the most resilient pe people that I have ever seen. Um, it does not matter where you are. Um, we could be driving through a neighborhood that, again, is flattened. Um, but you have people coming back um, wanting to restart their lives again, um, doing whatever they can to support their families. You have numerous um, families um, in a one-bedroom apartment, um, which building is most likely mostly destroyed, um, but they're coming back because they care. They want to, to reestablish their roots in their community. Did you hear specifics 
from the Syrians that you engaged with on this question of trauma? Were you able to engage with either parents worried about their children or hear from children directly? Um, kind of how the conflict is affecting them emotionally. So speaking with some of our community-based um, organization staff who work directly with the children on psychosocial support, um, they had said that what we're doing is very minimal. Um, in the, the larger scheme of things, as Dr. Hamza said, it's I think earlier today when we were kind of discussing um, before this started, it's the drop in the bucket. Mm -hmm. um, and what is needed to go forward is beyond, I think, what just the three of us in our organizations are doing now. Um, but parents and teachers um, were very excited that activities were being kind of implemented. Children were re-engaging, learning how to be children again, um, instead of you know picking up a, a weapon and, and using it or um, using the indoctrination that ISIS um, had instilled in them. So, um, Amy, let's, we, we hear a lot this term psychosocial mm -hmm. support. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what that means. What is psychosocial support? And talk a little bit about what kinds of things, what are the specific interventions that, that Save the Children is implementing? Sure. Uh, the term psychosocial, at the very basic level, it, it implies, so it's a, a, mix, a mix of psychological and social, the words, and it just implies that your, psycho, your psychological well-being or your internal well-being is in fact affected by your social well-being. So if your social um, surroundings are not doing well, then your internal um, well-being will not do well. So if we can improve social conditions or connect children or grown-ups to positive factors in their lives and we can improve or protect their, their internal well-being. And so psychosocial support activities or resilience building activities are meant to look at creating positive factors in children's lives. And some examples could be um, connecting children to trusted adults, connecting children to um, friends in different activities, connecting children to activities to promote joy and reduce stress at the very, very basic level. Um, at the higher level of intervention, children ne need more specialized services with mental health providers. One, ex so one ex specific example that will exemplify resilience building psychosocial support activities that Save the Children is finding um, success within the region is our HEART program, which HEART stands for Healing and Education Through the Arts. And HEART is Save the Children's approach to the expressive arts for, for healing. And when I say expressive arts, I'm talking about the range. So art, um, drawing, art, clay, modeling, traditional storytelling, uh, traditional drama, activities that bring joy to children's lives. And in the HEART program, we're implementing in school, temporary learning centers, child centers, child-friendly spaces. We see that the healing begins when children are finally able to express themselves after these traumatic events, either through their artwork or to a trusted, trained professional in the program. Uh, and the results that we are seeing are that children feel less isolated, more connected to peers, and making friends itself the ability to engage is a psychosocial support activity. Uh, we're also seeing children better able to engage in school. So as you can imagine, feeling stressed or scared has effect on your learning outcomes. So activities that can reduce that st stress can help children be more engaged in school. Uh, and we also have many stories of children who dropped out of school feeling afraid. Um, a lot of children have experienced bombing and shelling in their schools um, or on the way to school. Uh, and we've seen children actually return back to school after, return, after going through our HEART program. So that's just one example that we've seen success with in terms of psychosocial support programs in the region. Dr. Hamza, can you talk a little bit about how SAMS views what kinds of interventions they undertake with, again, with respect to the issue of, of trauma uh, inside Syria? Uh, enough interventions and all of that that I lost my hair and can't see well anymore. <laughs> uh, the amount of work is incredible. Um, we do have a comprehensive mental health services. See, and this is falling too. Okay. Um, 
the uh, complete mental health services, we assessed the situation um, in 2011. I mean, we still assess it every year almost. And um, what happened is that we decided that we are going to need a psychosocial services. Uh, we are going to need psychopharmacology, you know, medication mm -hmm. services. And we are going to have to have training and so on. Uh, it was a big challenge um, to um, to work on all those items, and specifically when you do not have enough people. Uh, we grew from um, two individuals doing all the work because it was very hard in the beginning, in 2011, 2012, to convince the medical community when they are dealing with uh, amputees and they are dealing with physical injuries to talk about the psychological injuries. Mm -hmm. So you come into someone that is trying to put an arm together or a finger to an arm or something and say, well, what are we gonna do about this? And um, so it took a lot of work um, and that's how we started. So we started the psychosocial you know, uh, uh, programs. We developed a number of programs for the children and those in different refugee camps and also the psychopharmacology as well. The difficulties that we faced, and it is a tremendous difficulties, is that the environment is not helping. Um, uh, host countries had difficulties, and we had a lot of difficulties. For example, medications, uh, paying for medications, getting the medications ready, as, as you know. Um, so for example, if we're gonna use a mood um, you know, disorder medication, let's say Abilify, and in the United States, it would be about 10 to 15 bucks. You go to some of those countries without naming the countries, and the price goes about 10 to 20 times higher. Mm -hmm. uh, well, how are you going to get those medications? And then they do not allow you to get free medications from here mm -hmm. to there. You have to buy from their own countries. So we face one problem after the other. And you can't tell someone, well, I give you a little bit of Abilify mm -hmm. today, mm -hmm. and then I'll put you on chamomile next month. You know, you can't do that. Um, you have to continue the medications. And also the problem with practicing medicine. So only in specific areas, like in Zatari camp, for example, we can practice, but it doesn't matter what your credentials are and so on, you're not allowed just to go to any area and just write prescription or work with, uh, I'm, I'm getting to the details of it. So it's, it's a lot of difficulties that we have faced, we're still facing, and so on. That's in the refugee camps. Then you have inside Syria. So inside Syria, it became a bigger problem in 2014, 15, 16, and now, of course, because of all the airstrikes and the problems that's been going on. So we came up with the telepsych. So what we have, we have doctors on the other end, okay, inside Syria, and we have our own doctors and nurses and so on here, and therapists, and what we do, we train them over there on what to do, and we see the patients via, via telepsych. It's kind of like what we do in the U.S. when, you know, you see your psychiatrist or psychologist or therapist, but telepsych ways, and that's how we are able to see many, many patients. Of course, the problem is, you know, you work, you're doing a great job, and boom, you know, airstrike, you're gone, the whole clinic is gone. Uh, and then you start again. So you, you don't look back, you just start. Uh, those are very difficult, uh, what you call, uh, moments, you know. Can I, so Katie, I was struck by a comment you made, if I understood you, you said putting, having children in the classroom does more harm than good. Can you expound on that and explain what you mean and talk a little bit then about how that has shaped the way the programming looks from the State Department's vantage point inside Syria? Mm -hmm. So when you put a child in a classroom that's not necessarily ready to go back, and a lot of what Amy had mentioned earlier, um, you know, the aggression, um, the, the not safe environment, they don't know how to interact with one another. Um, children won't be able to go from running around on the streets um, or having no sort of formal structure to then sitting in a classroom for five, six, seven, eight hours on a day, um, taking notes and, and learning. Um, so you have to treat a lot of the mental issues and the mental trauma before you're able to really get them learning the, the ABCs and the one, two, threes. Um, 
so in response to that, we have set up community-based organizations um, in Ain Issa, Tabka, and Raqqa with more on the way um, to help children with psychosocial support activities, many of which Amy had mentioned with the art um, and the theater and the dancing. Um, going into some of our centers in, inside of Northeast Syria, um, you see drawings on one side where children who had first entered the center, um, we were asked, we asked them, or the center had asked them to really draw what their life meant. What, does, what do you see as your life right now? Um, and some of these photos, um, kind of seeing it firsthand and then taking a photo of the photo and reflecting on it um, you know, two months later, um, it's incredible. They had drawn themselves with a sword in their hand, an ISIS member next to them, um, a coalition plane above, um, and someone just kind of a head lying on the floor. Um, you have people with guns, um, women completely covered in black, um, children coming in with ISIS propaganda songs that they're singing. Um, but through the support um, activities that we are providing to them, um, many of them are now drawing nature. Um, they're drawing their lives in the bus going to the center. Um, so I, I think it's night and day. Still a lot of work to be done. Um, again, a drop in the bucket mm -hmm. of what we're doing. Um, in addition to the centers, um, because we know there is a lot of children that are unable to actually get to our centers, um, who live in more of the smaller villages, um, we are doing some mobile PSS, um, so getting a, a team of trained individuals out into a village to do smaller activities with children. Um, and then now, training teachers, beginning to train mm -hmm. teachers in classrooms mm -hmm. um, on child protection and norms within a classroom. So both engaging children and teachers on, okay, what are the appropriate behaviors? What is acceptable in a classroom? What is not acceptable? And getting the buy-in of both the children and the teachers so that it's more of a unified approach versus one that's forced upon them. So I, before I open it up, I want to kind of pivot the discussion a little bit now towards some of the longer term implications mm -hmm. of why it is so important that this issue be addressed now. And um, uh, Amy, maybe you could start. You talked about this idea of toxic stress mm -hmm. and the ways in which it's, it sounds as though if not addressed, one almost reaches a point of no return, or there's a, I, well, expound on it. I mean, is mm -hmm. it the idea that if, if this trauma issue isn't addressed fairly soon and constructively, that there's more permanent, uh, there are more permanent issues that, mm -hmm. that then have to be contended with? Talk a little bit about the longer term implications. Sure. Uh, so, what we were talk, talking about with toxic stress is that there is, so there is evidence that shows if children are living with a, a long-term situation of toxic stress, it will impede the healthy development of their brain. Um, so they will have long-term effects both mentally and physically. And so this not only affect, affects their future and their healthy living, but I think one of the important things I'd like to build off what we're talking about is also affects their education. And that's one of the main things that we're concerned about when we talk about there could be a lost generation as well. So there, we estimate there's two million children inside Syria who are not attending school, and I believe it's 43% of the Syrian refugee population outside. So that almost another million, three million children right now still not returning to school. Mm -hmm. And our research and our report also shows around 50% of those who are attending school do not feel safe. And as we just discussed, if you don't feel safe in school, you're not learning. Uh, so, and so if you're feeling stressed, if you're living in a situation of toxic stress, you're not learning. And the loss of education has an enormous psychological toll on children and their families' lives. And we also have to consider if we have a full generation, we're talking about eight years here, if we have a full generation of children who have not reached their full potential in terms of education and development, what does that mean for the rebuilding of a post-war Syrian society? No, exactly, and I think you, you've actually teed up very well what I wanted to ask Dr. Hamsa, which is exactly that question. We talked about it a little bit in some of our earlier conversations in preparing for the panel, but from your vantage point, how do you see that challenge in terms of um, the ways in which trauma, if unaddressed, really will impede 
the longer term prospects for Syria's uh, recovery and, and, and ultimately one would hope uh, place it on a more stable, peaceful path. Right. Um, let me back up a little bit because honestly, I don't know if everybody can see it, but let me, let me explain it a little bit better. Let's assume that you have a very abusive father in a very abusive relationship, and then the children are watching and witnessing what's going on. So you have two layers. You have one layer where there are, the abuse is going on, and it's continuous, and it's continuous. Then you have a therapist and a teacher that trying to help the children, but that layer of abuse is still continuing. So the question here, is there any impact, any efficacy, as we say, you know, in medication? Like if you take a medication, is it really working for you? Or is it just you're popping the medicine and nothing is happening? So the question is, is there any efficacy, any impact of what the teacher and the therapist are doing when the abuse is continuing? All kinds of abuse. And let's say that it is severe abuse. And that's what's going on. So when we talk about the trauma, and we talk about education, and we talk about everything, it's, we cannot really talk about it as two different contexts. They're all in the same. So we say the children are doing better. Are they really doing better? When they just got had, they just had, for example, a month ago, over 198 airstrikes, chemical attacks, organophosphate toxicities going on, People are dying left and right because of somatic and physical problems, foam and everything, breathing problems, and they're dying. The death is secondary to the chemical attack. And then you say, okay, only 5% has been impacted, let's say, but the others are still displaced and jumping from one to another to another one place to another, but those are all connected families. It's like John and Michel, they are kind of safe, but their brothers, Bobby and Jimmy, they're the ones that's being killed and tortured. Well, is there an impact on the ones? Well, the one that died, died. They're gone. But what about the living ones? What about the living ones? So honestly, when we look at it, and, and, and I'm the type, I'm trying to see the bright side on the other, you know, at the end of the tunnel. I don't know if there's one tunnel, maybe there's thousands of tunnels, is that we are dealing with symptoms of the problem. And as long as chemical attacks and ethnic cleansing and genocide happening now, at this time, I mean, when we heard about the Holocaust, you know, years ago we were like, okay, they didn't know any better. They were stupid, and the world didn't do what it was supposed to do. But there were many other holocausts happened, right, in Bosnia? And then now, and we're going like, and the world? And it's happening. It's happening. Right after the strike that happened by the US, he striked his own people again. So there was another strike against humanity. And let me say humanity, because we live, even though we say we are here and they're there, but trust me, in any systems theory you look at, we are all connected. And it might not reach us today, but it will reach one time. It's a circle. It's going on. And it's going fast. Not fast according to our times, but it's going fast according to the system theory. Meaning that all those children, what's going to happen to them? That's a big question. Any intervention is it going to help for sure, all the great work you're doing and so on. But the problem is you take care of 20 and then boom, another 100 is coming now your way. It's like you can't put enough in the pipeline going like, okay, I'm, 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 I'm doing great here. Yeah, but we have another 1,000 coming in. Why? Because there's another attack, another airstrike, another area has been destroyed and it's coming your way. So it's, it's a never end. And uh, ending beyond nightmare, okay, that is happening. So education is big, but education is not only big. For example, even in the refugee camps and so on, when we say refugee camps, you know what they are? They are refugee camps. You can't walk out. You've been there for eight years. You live in a tent. 
You feel a little freezing here, you go home, you get cozy. They don't get cozy. It's a tent. Between you and the environment, a sheet of you know, material. That's all. It's a tent. Mm -hmm. I th well, I think this is actually a, a good moment if, to, to, bring the, to bring the audience yes, in, so yes, if yes. I could. So why don't we, yes, and we have a microphone, I believe. So if you just raise your hand, then yes, just right up, right up here. Thank you. And once you get the mic, please just uh, your name and affiliation if you have one, and then the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, just my utmost respect to all of the panelists up there and the amazing work that you're doing and also for USIP for hosting this extremely important issue. And personally, from my work, I believe it's so under-discussed. Sorry, can um, you give sorry. your name? And yeah, my name is Alexandra Thame. Okay. I work in northern Lebanon by the border of Syria oh. in Syrian refugee camps yeah. that I've witnessed many of the things you guys have been discussing from the children, aggressive behavior, being extremely accustomed to warplanes over their heads. Um, so for me, it's also been a very uh, emotional experience working with these children and so I, my very direct question to the three of you is um, the war trauma is very obvious in the children, again, referencing things that happened to them back in Syria. But what has become very clear to me over many years with these children on the ground is that there's clearly a trauma of their ongoing conditions in the camps. Mm -hmm. As you were just discussing, Dr. Hamza, about living in this tent life where your tent is flooded in the winter mm -hmm. and scorching hot in the summer. And I work with children that were, again, out of school for five years. There's no UN there, there's no NGOs, they've been on their own. And um, similar to actually what Katie was mentioning, I mean, imagining these children that are just used to being aggressive with each other, suddenly trying to put them in a space when some of them finally now are going to school is just, we're not seeing a tangible impact from this that's positive on their development. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious if you can, ex if any of you can expand a bit on maybe what that trauma is like of, okay, there's the war trauma from Syria, and then there's the trauma of living in a refugee camp. And I really appreciate that, you know, there's been work done to expand beyond the traditional definitions of PTSD and whatever we're used to, because clearly this is much more complex, it's much more deep, and as you emphasize, Dr. Hamza, it's ongoing. So, thank you very much. Mm. So, perhaps Dr. Hamza and, and Amy, and I don't know if you have thoughts on this, but I, on this broader question of how the conditions differ uh, in, in refugee camps and what are the specifics of trauma that, that uh, children and, and Syrians more broadly face? Yeah. Let, let, let me first talk about, from a neuroscience point of view, the brain, for example, let's say that when you eat an apple or eat or drink a Coke, the brain doesn't know that this is an apple and this is, of course you identify it as an apple or whatever, but the processing that goes through the you know, the body and so on, and how the brain takes your glycogen and the sugar, the sugar and so on, uh, you know, it processes it and so on. The trauma is the same way. So I'm, I'm using an, a little analogy here. So the trauma is still going on. So the brain is still traumatized. So one trauma, you're hearing, you know, you don't hear anymore the airstrikes, you don't hear the bombing, you don't hear the bombs, you don't see bodies, but now you're going through a completely different type of psychological trauma where there is a humiliation. So everything that's going on is programmed. So on one hand, you are shocked, you hear the shots, you hear the, uh, uh, the war machines and so on, and you are afraid. And we start with PTSD. Well now, we're giving you a cocktail of different disorders and different fears and different anxieties and so on, and now you're living the humiliation. You're not even a second or third class citizen. You are just, excuse my language, been treated like an animal. You're an animal human in this camp. The host countries, and I'll never forget one time, when they asked host countries officials, okay, they said, well, why don't we just make, because a lot of individuals like, uh, you know, professionals and uh, architects and engineers said, we can do the same thing for almost the same cost of a 10. And the answer was, from two, three different places, if you make them too comfortable, they want to stay here. So, if I take that, that psychological, whatever you want to call it, concept. How would you feel if you put yourself in the shoe of that child? What kind of trauma would be you going through? Again, the low self-esteem, the humiliation, feeling you know you have no freedom, you can't get out, you can't be 
who you want to be. In addition to all of that, the abuse that is going on in the camps, from sexual abuse, that nobody wants to talk about it, to the physical abuse, to other abuses that those children are going through. It is beyond a human imagination. It is, and honestly, and I'm telling you this as an expert, it is beyond what any psychiatric or medical book has written about. And part of my practice, big part of my practice, I deal with forensic cases. So I have seen it all. You name it, I've seen it, civil and criminal. This is above and tops everything we have seen. So that's the trauma you're talking about, and that's what we see inside the refugee camps. And I don't want to say just refugee camps. A lot of times they're not in refugee camps, but they are in um, you know, uh, abandoned buildings and so on. And it is amazing, even when they open the door for education, that many, if not most, of the families say, there is no sense of sending the child to the school. Why? They put them in the afternoon, and they put two, three, four grades in one class, and the teacher is asleep. OK, some of them, maybe they're doing their job. But this is the truth. I went, and I saw, I saw it. And I was like, this is amazing. You put sixth and seventh and eighth and ninth grade, and you're sitting down, and the, the teacher is on the phone or whatever. They can't teach it. Anyway, that many students. So what did the family start doing? They said, you know what? We do not want to send them. Go find you a job out on the street to bring in some money. So is that a tragedy? Oh, yeah. A different type of tragedy, like I said, a cocktail of tragedies mm -hmm. that continues. And the world is still numb to it. Mm -hmm. Amy, from, from Save the Children's Vantage Point, thank you, Dr. Hamza. Do you have further uh, points to make? I mean, I think that th this idea, of course, that, as we know, majority of, of Syrian refugees are not in camps, but are living in mm -hmm. and amongst host communities or in these informal tented settlements. There are enormous issues with, with child labor that we know is a problem. But Amy, I don't know whether you had Anything further to add on this? Sure, and, and thank you for bringing that point up. I believe it's five million Syri Syrians now have left the country, um, and it's an important population to talk about, and they face their own unique, unique risks, as, we're talk as we've talked about. Our and what's important to bring up that, you, that you've been alluding to is that our experience shows that if a child experiences a traumatic event, if you can provide the basic necessities, um, food, water, shelter, a loving caregiver, uh, and safety and security, the majority of children will be able to bounce back from that traumatic event. And as we discussed inside Syria, that is not happen happening, particularly the safety and security um, piece, which doesn't allow children to regain a sense of normalcy. But the children who have left with their parents or by themselves living in refugee camps, uh, living in, ho in host urban communities and squat settlements um, or over crowded apartments, children who are still on the move through um, past multiple borders uh, are also ex re experiencing a sense of um, lack of physical safety. They're not accessing basic needs, food, food appropriate shelter, water. Uh, many of them have lost their loving caregiver, caregiver and love um, is oftentimes underestimated in terms of supporting children through traumatic events. It's extremely important. That's what our research tells us. And then children face unique threats, as we've, some of them we've discussed, sexual assault and exploitation in refugee camps and along the uh, migration or um, fleeing routes. Um, many children have fled from recruit, the risk of recruitment into armed forces and armed, armed groups, and they're experiencing that alone in a refugee camp. Um, and many children are also fa faced with other forms of exploitation. We talked about children in the worst forms of labor and, ex um, and begging on the streets. Uh, we have also seen an increase in early enforced marriage of Syrian refugees in refugee camps as a coping mechanism. All of this combined is what creates what we've just talked about, the toxic stress. So children are not able to recover as, as these um, incidences in their life continue. And it's a very important population and group of children to make sure that we include in the discussion. So thank you for bringing that question. Katie, I know your fo work is focused largely inside Syria, but I don't know if you had additional thoughts on refugee populations and, and issues that they face. So not particularly to refugees, but I think just something to note across the board, um, and both Amy and Dr. Hamza have alluded to it, is that while the focus of this conversation is primarily on children, mm -hmm. um, 
what we also have to focus on is their parents and their communities. Um, because as many of us know, if our parents are arguing, um, we feel it as children coming down. And so that stress um, that they're exhibiting is then placed on us. Mm -hmm. um, so not only dealing with children, but dealing with the older populations as well. Important point. Other questions, please. Just raise your hand and we'll acknowledge you. Yes, here? Yes. Okay. Can you raise your hand a little bit higher? Thank you. And Hey, um, so I'm glad you uh, mentioned the um, impact. Sorry, if you could just identify just your name and affiliation, and then uh, okay. please ask your um, question. My name is Tom Fu, and I work with the Institute for Global Engagement. And um, so I'm, I just have a question about um, the traumatic experience on adults and then how that are playing out in their lives, how that impact their behaviors. Thank you. Anyone in particular want to, want to take that question? Let, let, let me talk about, um, you know, a lot of issues really we, um, we try not to talk about. But um, you know that Iskuta has been under siege for a number of years, four or five years. And we had to deal with a number of dilemmas. And again, we're doing the telepsych here. Mm -hmm. So we're talking and we're trying to see how we could help. So children as young as eight years of age, for example, leaving, you know, um, their area and going to the other side where, you know, the regime is um, available so they can get, um, uh, you know, uh, basic uh, material or stuff like rice, food, and so on. And when a child leaves, like, let's say, around the, the the time around 7 at night and come back at 2 o'clock in the morning. You can imagine the type of favors you will, you know, you will serve your predators with so you can bring in some food. That created a number, an immense number of abnormal behaviors at the very young age. Why? There is no father, and if there is a father, paralyzed, crippled, missing. There is a mom that couldn't do, or sick, or ill, or a caretaker. So you do not have anymore the normal structure of a family. Mm -hmm. And those that know Syria, for example, and know the Syrian structure of families and how close-knitted they are, this is totally abnormal to the, um, you know, uh, to the climate you know, the, the cultural and social climate. But those are important issues that we've been dealing with. And we try, and we try through Besmet Lamel, for example, one of the schools, you know, and it's been bombed um, just uh, about four or five weeks ago. And uh, we lost many staff members and so on. So you try, you know, like I said, you know, um, uh, uh, a drop in the bucket to do something. But you fix something here. It's like you fix the electricity, now it's your plumbing. You fix the plumbing, and then it is something else. You could never get it right. So uh, you deal with what you have. So that's, that's a big uh, problem, is that we're seeing a lot of odd behaviors, abnormal behaviors, and many disorders at a very young age. Other, other thoughts on this particular question? Uh, just to add and also reiterate the importance for us at looking at the mental health of adults who are raising their children because parents who are who are distressed, we do see an increase in violence and physical abuse in the home. Mm -hmm. um, they, they feel that parents who aren't coping might um, it might lead to negative discipline methods uh, and we also see them resort to even more extreme negative coping mechanisms when they can't when they're having a difficult time dealing providing for the children in their house and it, and remember these are families who have lost everything um, and the level of stress of having a household of children uh, 
creates. And those negative coping mechanisms that we just discussed are sending the child to, to beg on the street or sending the, their young girl children to be married in a house. We talk to parents who really believe that's the best option for their household right now is for a young girl to be married early because she can actually access more resources in the other house and it also alleviates the burden in their household. So um, the issue of, of adults trauma and distress and toxic stress is extremely important for us in terms of looking at children's well-being. I know you had actually noted that mm -hmm. in your, in your mm -hmm. previous intervention. One, one yeah. question that came to my mind as you all were talking is the issue of stigma and whether there is an issue with cultural stigma around uh, emotional illness or mental illness uh, or, or trauma I mean, is, is that an issue that you have to contend with? Or, uh, and I'll, I'll start maybe with you, Dr. Hamza, and others if you want to chime in. Or, or is stigma not uh, an issue that, that is, has presented itself on this? You know, amazingly, it's, it's not anymore. They, they're asking for it, and they're asking for services. Uh, toward the beginning, maybe, but I think when they s notice and re they realize the benefit of mm. uh, mental health services, they ask for it and um, they say, and I need this and I need that. And we have to be careful specifically with medications as well. But um, it's, um, the program is doing very well specifically, you know, uh, we have a great operation in, uh, in Jordan, for example, if I use that as uh, an example of other refugee camps. We have clinics in Erbid, uh, we have clinics in, um, in Al Zatari, a large clinic, mental health clinic, in addition to um, our large um, uh, clinical facility in Al Zatari, for example, and also uh, wherever we are allowed to, um, uh, to operate. So, um, and if there is anything, it is um, needing more staff, needing more funds, needing more uh, grants so it can help us do the job. A lot of, uh, many uh, professionals, uh, if I say sometimes waiting in line just to jump in and uh, to help. But with the people, I mean, it is amazing, you know, if, if, if they miss one session, they go back or they call or they come by and say, hey, I missed my session and um, I need to see if it's a psychosocial, if it's mm -hmm. a therapy session because we have, uh, you know, psychotherapies and so on. And one thing I wanted to say, uh, we do have the best of training because simply, um, like in the United States, the Mental Health Committee, we have a number of psychiatrists and um, psychologists and neurologists. Um, uh, they are not only practitioners, but they are also professors in the field. And we take turns, you know, going um, and uh, training the staff there. For example, um, just as we speak right now, the psychotherapist um, uh, in Lebanon and in Jordan will be trained by one of the top, uh, top EMDR uh, therapists, um, a psychiatrist by the name of Dr. Sultan, uh, um, a, Syri a Syrian British uh, psychiatrist. And he's one of the um, biggest name in the field of EMDR that is training our, you know, um, psychotherapists mm -hmm. and so on. So they do get the best of what we have. And if we cannot reach them, like all the areas inside Syria, we do it through telepsych. So we have an entire team dedicated just for telepsych training and then telepsych services as well. And I think with doing all of this is that the people are aware of it and they're you know, they're needing the services and they come and uh, they, I guess they benefit from our services. I would echo Dr. Hamza. Um, as I noted previously, when we first started doing psychosocial activities inside uh, northeastern Syria, there was a bit of a pushback from the local community and local governance bodies um, until we really kind of set forth and said, okay, this is what we're doing. Um, and showed them the, the advantages and the impacts of what our programming could do. Um, so now, you know, instead of pushing us out, they're welcoming, welcoming us in um, and wanting us to establish more centers, um, engage more children, um, work with, you know, the UN and other international organizations like SAVE to, to kind of team up um, and, and address more children. Um, I think it's important to note that one of the first centers that we opened up um, you know, because of our capacity and because of the, the resources that we had available at the time, 
we could only really target a small number of children. Mm -hmm. um, the children that weren't accepted into the, the center, I guess we could say, um, because they didn't meet the initial requirements. Um, I have videos of them standing outside on the fence, holding the fence, crying, mm -hmm. um, and throwing rocks inside because mm -hmm. they were not able to participate in activities. Mm -hmm. um, I can say fortunately that those kids are now in centers, um, or at least um, in classrooms where we have mobile centers. Um, so really trying to engage with them. Um, and this is a serious issue that goes beyond just the three of us in our conversations. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yes. Um, why don't we go all the way to the back, the woman in the dark coat? Yes. And again, please identify yourself. You. Hello. Yes, I'm Stacy Chamber with ICANN, the International Civil Society Action Network. Um, I want to thank all of you for uh, your comments today and uh, for sharing all of your expertise. ICANN has partners in Syria, uh, Turkey, and Iraq, and I've been in conversation with them about ways in which we can best support their work, which uh, sometimes includes psychosocial support, but uh, is certainly not um, specialized in that. And I just wanted to hear from your perspectives about uh, working with local partners and certainly with Sam's expertise. Um, what, from your perspective, would be most needed for the local organizations on the ground there? Is there a way in which you are uh, training others or that we can enhance uh, the work, the coordinated work that you're already doing? Thank you. Why don't we maybe start, Amy, with you? Yeah, sure. Yeah, that would be great. And then move over to the rest of you. Um, from our perspective, working with and through local partners is our preferred method. Um, we find that it, well, it lends to sustainability, and also that's our goal, to be building the capacity of the region um, to be able to support, support and ongoing rebuilding efforts. And um, to do this, one of our, so, I guess the question is perspective of local partners maybe being prepared to work with children in terms of psychosocial support. A lot of times psychosocial support activities don't have to be intensive as we talked about. Sometimes just connecting children with their peers or with trusted adults or helping teachers be uh, ready to be able to work with children who are distressed that we talked about earlier. And we, we are working with local partners to build our capacity in that. One of the first trainings that we um, offer or suggest um, is psychological first aid for child practitioners. And psychological first aid, while it has a fancy title, it's just basically a set of tools and resources on how to talk to children who are distressed um, and also how to take care of your own staff's well-being because that's critical for working in this situation. Uh, toxic stress can also happen in adults and if we have people working with children who are um, working in a state of toxic stress or burning out, uh, we're not obviously going to be very effective for the long term. So we, that, that would be, that's our major recommendation is making sure that you have a prepared staff um, working with another organization that has technical experience in that to build the capacity in that and to understand what you're doing. And um, just add one more important thing as I'm talking about that. Also critical if you are going to be working with children in these um, areas is to make sure that you are linked up to professional mental health services if they exist. Uh, that always has there always has to be an option for that as well. Did you have anything to add, Katie, on this question of local partners and how how that relationship works from your vantage point? Um, so one of the things that we've been fortunate enough to have is that a lot of the staff members that work in our centers um, have been trained by Save or by the UN um, through UNICEF. Um, so they have come over from you know further northeast Syria into Ainisa, Tabqa, Raqqa area. Um, and so they kind of pick up the pieces for us. We provide them additional remote training mm -hmm. um, through a trained psychosocial support um, expert. Um, we tailor the trainings based on what they have told us that they're experiencing on the ground. If they've talked to a child who has had X, Y, and Z, they then talk through it and find the best way to approach it. Um, dealing with local partners while challenging because of the lack of potential capacity um, is also extremely rewarding, as Amy said, because of the, the long-term sustainability, something that um, they can continue on with years down the road. Mm -hmm. And I know, Dr. Hamza, you've spoken already at length about the training and the work that's being done with local Syrian doctors on the ground, but are there other comments that come to mind on this question? Yeah, I, I think the, um, all the lo local 
and the external inner groups like your group, I can, you know, save the children, your department, and so on. I think they should have a, 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 a good connection of what's going on to not replicate the same work. And if you're needing expertise, then you can find it. So for example, if saves the children, they're talking about toxic stress, okay. They look at it as a major issue, which is, it is a major issue. We look at it as one component of the human devastation syndrome from a clinical perspective, mm -hmm. right? So we're looking at things from a psychiatric and mental health because we are very comprehensive. And it's unfortunate, but eight years of uh, agony and uh, you know what's going on, devastation, gave us a lot of skills in knowing clinically what needs to be done as well as medically. Uh, like I said, you know, SAMS has been, within SAMS itself, they have been, the, uh, mental health is uh, one of the highest, if not the highest priority to SAMS at this point. Mm -hmm. Because we understand where we're at and we understand the psychological entry, both from a physical point of view and from a psychiatric point of view. Now I think, other than advocacy, other than building capacity, I think there should be building unity among all of ourselves. That if there is something, like Kate, if she needs something, she can pick up the phone and say, okay, here's the situation, what do I do? Can I get some help? Because toward the end, you want all the rivers to pour in the same you know, uh, uh, spot, instead of each one doing its own, which is great, but there has to be unification of efforts and skills and abilities. We, we, do we need the grants and, 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 and the financial capacity and we need that? Definitely, because the cost, you would not believe how tremendous it is, even though we try to stretch the dollar in so many directions. Other questions? Yes, gentlemen here. With the Thank you. Uh, my name is Hatem Ambari. I'm from uh, Iraq Embassy. Uh, my question about the so-called the Caliphate Cubs. Uh, we have seen uh, many uh, videos on tapes that uh, ISIS has been have been trying to recruit children to be uh, fighting members, and we have seen videos also children uh, beheading uh, innocent people. Uh, my question: uh, Are there any specific uh, programs to help these children to? Uh, to bring them back to normal life. Thank you. Who would like to take that one on children of ISIS? Uh, sure. Um, I can't speak specifically to that specific groups of children, but what I can say, obviously what you describe can have a devastating impact on children, and um, there is a need for any children experiencing those traumatic events to be in a situation where they can be accessing mental health and appropriate care. We have, you know, through our community-based organizations, we've had a number of children who not necessarily participated in beheadings, um, but did enroll um, in ISIS schools. Um, and so, you know, hearing their stories of how they learned to count, for example, it wasn't, you know, one sheep, two sheep, three sheep, it was one grenade, two grenade, three grenade. Um, so kind of reversing their, their psychology um, and, and just having them express their feelings and, and their thoughts. Um, and at that point, you know, stuff that our programming can't handle because it's at the very basic level, referring it up to uh, another organization who has more trained um, therapists on hand. Um. If I answer you, then I'm going to make your hypothesis accurate, and I disagree with your hypothesis. Because ISIS is political, it's not religious. And we know why and how it was created. We don't need to get there. But I can tell you, as an extremist group that was created for specific purposes, to serve specific purposes, for specific you know, entities, when a child is lost, and when a child has lost it all, any predator, if you want to call it a sexual predator, if you want to call it a political predator, if you want to call it a propaganda predator, is game. So our goal is, and specifically when we dealt with, we focus on the children, is that we do not want that aggression in children. When I met with a lot of children, 
hundreds of children and the beginning of this whole, you know, ethnic cleansing, genocide. Every child, the boys, of course, specifically ages 10, 12, and so on, they ask them, what do you want to do? And they say, I lost my dad, I lost most of my family. I can't wait to be strong and take arms and just go back and fight and kill those that killed my dad. Of course, who killed his dad? <laughs> you know, everybody's fighting and killing each other, you know. So we want to mitigate those uh, features and characteristics of aggression and, um, and revenge and so on and show them the other side. And that's one of our biggest focus. So when I say we are comprehensive, we can't just take psychosocial and say you're going to be fine. So if you are, for example, if you have let's say HDS, Human Devastation Syndrome. If you have that, I can't just say I'll give you psychosocial and you're gonna be fine. It's gonna be much more than that. There's gonna to have to be psychosocial. There's gonna to have to be therapy. The therapy has to be particularly and um, skillfully um, uh, selected. Then the medication comes in and kicks in and then there's the education part. So you're talking about a comprehensive component and the way I want you to think about it, if, if I have a vet that has a PTSD, we can't tell them, okay, we're gonna have, you know, just a little therapy and everything will be fine. No, everything will not be fine. How long is the therapy? What type of therapy do you wanna do? How many times during the week? And what kind of psychosocial programs and what kind of medications? So you're targeting specific features. I mean, this is a, a, a big science. And honestly, we thought we learned about the psychiatric world when we started, and I was like, oh my God, we have not seen any of this before. Mm -hmm. It's not in the medical books, it's not. And you're dealing with an, a side, a dark side that we have not seen before, prior to this. And now we're dealing with it. So let it be, like I said, whatever the entity is, it, you know, the children are prey and the children are the victims, and we want to turn them from victims to good citizens, and that's our goal. I think we have time for one more question. Yes, woman right here with the butterfly scar. Yeah. That's a good description. <laughs> Hi, um, so I'd like to, Sorry, if you since could I'm, just identify oh right, my name is Jen, and I work with girls and young women around the world to develop them as peacemakers, mm -hmm. and I'd like to, since I'm the last question, in with the light of hope, um, and actually, I gave a keynote at USIP on International Day of the Girl because we launched the first ever um, Syrian Girls and Young Women Empowerment Survey. And we found three things, and I call them superpowers of empowerment of Syrian young women. And the first was resilience. And second was hope and aspiration. And the third was action and accountability. Now, mind you that this was a very special population. My focus is millennials, so these were all millennial young women, and it, was, it spanned 20 countries um, in and outside of Syria. 50% were in Syria, and the 50% were outside of Syria, including United States and Western countries. And they were all going to school. And, the ac and so going back to the action accountability, 100% of these young women, they were all getting educated, and they were all learning skills and developing skills because their hope and aspiration was to go back to Syria and be able to rebuild their country. So I can't help but to think, this is your army. Okay. How can we have them? They all want to go back. They don't have an avenue or even a specific. I mean, they're all studying in UK or Sweden or Dubai or wherever. And Syria, actually, 50% was in Damascus. How do we connect them with you and your work? Because I, I mean, I feel they, we know they're going to rebuild Syria. It's not us over here and us sitting in this room. So how can we do this connection? Okay. So I would ha ask you each to respond to that question. And maybe in addition, I would add one other small thing, which is sort of what do you see as the greatest need going forward? Where, what would you all like to see in terms of interventions going forward? And why don't we start with Dr. Hamza and work our way through, and I think it would responses need to be somewhat brief as we're coming toward the uh, close of the event. Um, if I tell you an airplane has two wings and a body and this is how it flies, that's not the answer, right? The answer is we connect at some level 
and I'm willing to share all my contact information with you. But then the other party that wants to jump in, and there has been in the past eight years many parties that say, I want to, you know, they become enthusiastic, I want to come in. And then when you start and say, okay, this is what we're going to do, the amount of work is incredible, tremendous. My life is never the same for the past eight years, it changed. I had to make a deal with my wife and kids, you know, it's like this is my mission. And David, understand, you know, when our meeting starts at 9 and finishes at 2 o'clock in the morning, once, twice a week, trying to figure out, you know, what to do and how to solve this problem. So when you tell people this is what we need to do and then suddenly out of the hundred that wants to help, you get one person to stay. Because they want you to do the job and go like, okay, here's the idea, and just run with it. No, you're going to run with me and we're going to do it. So to me, we can share contact information, all of us. We can decide on some mechanism of what needs to be done. And again, we are going to hit one wall, and that is who is going to fund all of this. Uh, having just said that, just to let you know, we are at SAMS. We are taking care of all the dropouts because, you know, they're not, they're displaced, something happened, you know, to them in one area or another of medical students and nurses, like we have deals with Aleppo University to graduate nurses. Now we are trying to shoot for a medical school, okay, in Turkey. And we are taking those students and we are putting the top-notch students that fell out of this, their programs into medical school inside Turkey so they can come out. So we are planning 10, 20 years ahead of time. We're not going to lose the brightest. We're not, we're focused on that. So clinically we're doing the work, and I, I showed you only that part, but I think we don't have much time to go over the other stuff. But on the other hand, we are doing incredible things to prepare the new generation. We've lost many health workers. Of course, you know that medical facilities has been targeted, uh, medical workers been targeted and killed and so on. So what are we doing? Okay, no problem. We'll regenerate. And we're working with a lot of medical students. This May, the first week of May, I will be the keynote speaker where we brought in a sister organization. It's called Samah, okay? And they do a lot of training for medical training and so on and education for the Syrians in Europe and Turkey and inside Syria. And we're going to have the first mental health um, conference. And we have so many medical students and psychology students and mental health students coming in so they can benefit and we're doing, them all, we're doing a lot of training. So now, what you're talking about is awesome. And Karam, for example, Foundation is doing you know, similar things. So the thing is, let's unite, let's see what it takes, let's find the funds so we can go for it and find the human capital to do the job. And we're open, we're open for any, anything, we're, we're trying. And thank you so much for your uh, excellent question. Um, that is great comment because uh, while what we're talking about here really sounds bleak, we also found the same glimmers of hope in our research. In fact, I brought a quote from Ara 15 from Aleppo uh, when she was in a focus group and we asked, asked children what they wanted most. She said, I want a school and teachers to teach us and lots of students so we can be happy and get educated and read and learn. We also meet countless children who tell us when asked, what do you want? How are you feeling? I want to go back to school. And they specifically tell us, I want to become a doctor or a nurse or a teacher to help Syria rebuild. And we have to continue engaging that. Um, and I guess my answer to what, the, what, what we want to see is a global, renewed global commitment and action on education and the support needed to address the barriers to education including the critical mental health support that we're talking about today. And in terms of connecting uh, young people and youth in the region that you're talking about, I mean, I would love, we, we work in adolescent clubs and youth centers in the region, but I would love to see a global youth network that is connecting and, and keeping them engaged um, because when it is time to rebuild, and we see that there's hope for that, it will be Syrian driven, it will be the, the young people that we're going to be counting on. Katie? And just to finally close, I think going back to a previous comment about the Syrians, um, regardless of you're in Syria or outside of Syria, is the resiliency. Mm -hmm. um, so 
the Syrians themselves, regardless of when this horrible war will end, will be the ones to, 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 kind of, to take the lead. Um, and I think one of the first steps, in addition to kind of the funding and, and uniting together, is just ultimate peace. Like, you can't get anything done unless you have access, and access means peace. Well, I want to thank the three of you uh, for the extraordinary work you are doing on the ground inside Syria amidst and, and, and in the surrounding countries amidst uh, enormously difficult circumstances. And I want to thank you in particular as well for coming and being with us today and imparting your important insights. So please join me in thanking our terrific panel.